Hi there and welcome to a personal video reflection from me on the Ravi Zachariah scandal that's shaken the world of Christian apologetics, especially since the release of the independent report, which leaves no doubt about the scale of Ravi's deception and abuse. I didn't want it to be true, but it was true. And now a global ministry has been shipwrecked and the legacy of one of the most influential Christian apologists has been just swept away. And I felt so sad for those close to Ravi whose trust was abused, for the many who believed because of his ministry and have now been left devastated, and most especially the victims who have suffered horrible spiritual, emotional and sexual abuse. And in the case of Laurie Ann Thompson, public defamation at the hands of Ravi and the ministry. The heart is deceitful above all things and beyond cure. Who can understand it? Says Jeremiah 17 verse 9. And that verse has been in my head recently, not just because of how it speaks to Ravi's own deceptive heart, but because of the ways that we're all willing to be deceived in one way or another. There's been a flood of responses since the independent report was published, laying bare the scale of Ravi's deceit. They debated how it happened, why it happened, whether Azim can or should recover from this, whether Ravi's book should be withdrawn and so on. And this isn't really a response about any of that precisely. It's more of a personal response, a mea culpa of sorts. Ravi was one of the preeminent Christian apologists in the world, and although I personally never met him or interviewed him for my unbelievable show, his fall touches very closely to home because I have worked closely with the wider team of Arzim. And shortly after his death in May 2020, I hosted a tribute show to Ravi, interviewing key leaders from Arzim. The warm words and anecdotes that were shared then have just turned to ashes in all our mouths, as, as have those that were shared by the celebrities and church leaders at his funeral service, which was live streamed to millions. We've now taken the step of taking down our own YouTube edition of that show we recorded, and I've added a disclaimer in our podcast archive that that show clearly no longer represents a true picture of Ravi. At the time we recorded it, the spa allegations were unknown, of course. But nevertheless, like so many others, I was too quick to give Ravi the benefit of the doubt over those sexting allegations from two years previous. I didn't ask the awkward questions I should have asked because, well, as I said, I didn't want it to be true. I wanted Ravi to be the hero of the hour, to have a great legacy for the work of Arzim to continue strong. I was wrong as were many of us who too willingly accepted the narrative that he and the organisation put out around the Laurie Ann Thompson affair. It was only when the new credible spa allegations came to light in September and the independent report eventually released its full damning conclusions about Ravi's predatory and abusive behaviour that we all realised just how wrong we were. None of us saw what was coming, but I should have been more sceptical to start with. For that reason, I do want to publicly apologise to people like Steve Borman of Ravi Watch and fellow apologist Randall Rouser, whose voices, frankly, I chose to tune out when they were in my timeline asking inconvenient questions about Ravi at the time of his death, while the rest of the world was heaping on adulation. I had wanted to believe in Ravi, the master apologist, the family man, the spiritual hero, but our heroes always have a habit of letting us down, don't they? And now with the truth laid bare, and perhaps only even a portion of that, I'm left with the question, how can we do better than this? Ultimately, the person responsible for what happened was Ravi Zacharias, and he'll answer to God for the sins against his victims that he took with him to the grave. But the rest of us need to ask ourselves hard questions about the kind of culture that allowed Ravi's deception to occur and to make sure it can't happen again. So here are five suggestions. One. We need to be more sceptical. We need to question our heroes. I run a show that involves asking and responding to hard questions from sceptics, but often we're not sceptical enough of those we admire. We all suffer in that way from confirmation bias, whether Christian, atheist or something else. To question a person, ideology or doctrine isn't to be disloyal. It's about using our mind critically, even when we may not like the answers. Number two, we need accountability. No one, no matter how much of a saintly demeanour they project, should be above the structures of accountability in an organisation, as Ravi evidently ended up being. Christian ministries founded on good intentions can often collapse 
because the practical realities of financial, ethical and organisational accountability weren't built in from the beginning. Uh, Number three, we need to focus on truth rather than reputation. Now, this sounds obvious, but it isn't always so obvious when you're in the thick of running a large, complex, multifaceted organisation. But the fact is the truth will out eventually as many religious and secular institutions have discovered after trying to cover up abuse allegations rather than bring them out into the light. And truth-telling can be an incredibly painful process. So is excising a cancer, but it's necessary if the body is to survive. As Jesus memorably put it, if your hand causes you to stumble, cut it off. It's better for you to enter life maimed than with two hands to go into hell. Number four, we need to repent. That means more than just saying sorry once the facts can no longer be denied. It's about making genuine reparation to victims, acknowledging our own complicity in a web of deception and making the changes that need to be made to ensure a culture that breeds that kind of deception doesn't occur again. And number five, we need to reform. It feels like there's a reckoning of sorts happening in the Christian church at the moment as a plethora of stories of fallen leaders have emerged in recent years. So why have we built so many ministries based around the charismatic personality of an individual? Why are we so good at creating pedestals for gifted but terribly flawed people to tumble from? What are the idols of success, fame and influence that we've inadvertently come to bow before? Too often it feels like it's back to business as normal after a restoration process or a ministry name change. But if the heart isn't changed and the ethos essentially remains the same then we're going to be doomed to repeat the mistakes of the past. So we need to learn our lessons. And I speak these words to myself as much as anyone else involved in Christian ministry, because Jesus won't be interested ultimately in how many people we reached or how successful our ministry was. He'll be interested in who we became, whether we grew more into his likeness. Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and in your name perform many miracles? Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. Those are stark words from Jesus, but we need to hear them because only by coming fully, frankly and honestly to Jesus can our own deceitful hearts be cured. Thanks for watching and I look forward to reading your thoughts in the comments. For more conversations between Christians and skeptics, subscribe to the Unbelievable podcast. And for more updates and bonus content, sign up to the Unbelievable newsletter.